the 40 farms. When we look at this on Holsteins, I've seen Holstein herds up as high as 0.4, and their fat test is down around 3 or 2.8. And these some Holstein herds get down as low as 0.5 and be up at 4.2, 4.3. Herds tend to run up in this higher range, and the herds will get down to 0.21, 0.22, and nothing will ever go above 0.31. So we're to understand, we think it relates to when, when this goes up, we get, and, and you're getting high number of double bonds for fatty acids. R squared of 0.7 in population, the load is either too high, the room and unsaturated fat acid load of that fat in the rumen is happening too easily and too much fat is being released in the rumen. I think that this metric is telling us something about that. that depression, what's interesting is that Formation of trans fatty acids that indirect biohydrogenation, when the value gets high, the double bonds per fatty acid, and with the de novo, the de novo are headed straight down, and squared is 0.85. This isn't herds. This is not something where we're doing a feeding study. This is in the field in terms of what we see. So we can understand that this metric of the unsaturation is a very interesting number that we can produce off the infrared on bulk tank and we can do it on individual cow milks too. Versus the 430 farms, as the level goes up, the protein percent goes up, and we think this relates to the rumen fermentation, biomass produced in the rumen. And basically at this point, at 0.85, if you hit a 3 1 protein or higher in Holstein herd, to be over 0.85 per hundred grams of milk in deal fatty acids to achieve that. But with some herds, Holstein herds that were in the group, that up in this range of 0.9 to 1 gram de novo fatty acids per hundred grams of milk, and Holstein's true protein, not a total nitrogen number, protein at 0.5 to 3.3. In year one, collected the two groups farms to be low and high in demo fatty acids, and they were. We expected that. But interesting is this is the first time we had milk plates. De novo, so there's the high concentration of fat and protein, actually we're producing more milk per cow per day into having the higher components. So now we're we're really starting to say this this is not Changes in concentration. So in the year one study, this difference in fat test to average for the for the uh, the groups, this difference in true protein. Now remember, these are Jersey herds, half of them, and Holstein uh, herds is about the same. The milk urea and nitrogen. It's at a reasonable level.
my presentation to you so that you can go ahead and take us through the the present the presentation. Right? Yeah. Okay, so thank good. you. So samples of milk have been used worldwide to measure fat, protein. Uh, are you slides? Another you need to move a little bit. Good. All right, about that. That's okay. Samples of milk have been used worldwide to measure fat, protein, and lactose for payment testing, as well as in dairy herd improvement programs. What others are learning is that there's much more that we can learn from these milk samples. A few years ago, at Cornell University, and Albans Co-op in Vermont, Minor Institute started a collaboration to develop new tools for bulk tank testing. The tools for red technology that can be analyzed, that can analyze milk quickly and cost effectively. The goal of the tools in particular acid metric models uh, was to help dairies make better or more timely decisions regarding feed and management of the herd that can contribute to improved yields of fat and protein in the milk. Over four monitored in the Salvin's Cooperative over a 15 month period. And what we found was that milk fat was positively related to de novo fatty acids in the milk, as shown in the upper right graph, as well as de novo fatty acids were positively related to total protein. And I'm showing the graphs for Holsteins, but the same pattern occurred for Jersey herds as well. What's unique about uh, these measurements made uh, at the farm level or on bulk tank was it was done at the same time as payment testing. This is not typical. Usually the acid measurements of milk are done in a laboratory using the gold standard method of gas chromatography, and it's slow and, ex and expensive. But using the mid-infrared technology, it gives us a way to more quickly and cost-effectively be able to monitor those measures on farm. relationships of milk fat and protein with the de novo and milk fatty acids, the St. Albans Cooperative started reporting values to producers in 2016. Just a screenshot showing the information the producers receive. And highlighted in the red oval are the new measurements or the metrics that's being reported. De novo fatty acids, mixed fatty acids, pre fatty acids, and double bonds, or and saturation index that gives uh, estimate of the amount of double bonds per fatty acid. Current cooperatives providing this information to their producers, including the Agrimark Cooperative and Cayuga Marketing Co-op, uh, both located in uh, the Northeast. And to these cooperatives providing milk fatty acid metrics back to the farmer, there are currently a couple other laboratories uh, providing information to farms that may not be part of the co-op but have interest in having their milk tested. In particular, there's two DHI uh, labs in Minnesota that's providing the information, as well as the Cornell lab and our lab here at Minor Institute where we can take outside samples and provide some information back. The Cornell lab and our lab are continuing to work, it on, work on new model development, and in particular, we're focusing on some individual cow model as well. Now, what started reporting milk fatty acid metrics for the very getting questions about what are these, these things, and there was a lot of confusion. And I encourage those that didn't get a chance to hear all of uh, Dr. Bano's talk just a few minutes ago, go back to the 2016 AMTS webinar, and he does a very nice overview providing uh, some of the background. Um, for this, I'm going to just, I think it helped to have a little bit of understanding of what milk fat is and how it's derived uh, to be able to understand these milk metrics. First of all, milk is composed of about 98% triglycerides. Triglyceride backbone shown here in this structure on the left-hand side. 
and it has three fatty acids attached with these squiggle lines on the right-hand side of the structure. Interesting, 400 unique fatty acids in milk. However, only about 20 fatty acids make up the majority. And we can group fatty acids into three subcategories, and essentially it's based on their source. The first fatty acids are the de novo fatty acids. These are the fatty acids that are shorter in length, less than 16 carbons in length. And they're made in the mammary gland, and they may be influenced by rumen fermentation and rumen function. They're up typically less than a third of the milk's fatty acids. The second is preformed fatty acids, and these fatty acids are longer in length, 16 carb greater than 16 carbons. And they're going to come to the mammary gland in the blood and come from two sources. They're going to come from fat in the diet, or they're going to come from body fat mobilization. And the acids contribute more than a third, almost 40%. 45% of the fatty acids found in milk fat. The third grouping that we focus on is mixed origin fatty acids, and these are our C16 in length fatty acids. And they're going to be from fat in the diet, or they can be from the de novo source and made in the mammary gland. In C3 form, they're going to be about a third to 40% of the milk fatty acids. And into these three fatty acid groups that we that are to as milk fatty acid metrics. We also have one other metric, and that's unsaturation or the double bonds um, that occur in that milk, and we look at an average of that. And typically, values are going to be somewhere in the range of 0.25 to uh, Here we have a Holstein herd with a 4.1% bulk tank fat test. And I just want to show you the relationship of total fat in the tank relative to the fatty acids that I just discussed. What we see is this herd, um, there's about 95% of the milk fat is going to be from the fatty acids, with the remainder being glycerol, making up about 5% of the total fat. And that we are emphasizing milk fatty acid profile is that they provide insight into the performance and health of the cow in the herd. In particular, the profile of de novo mixed and preformed fatty acids reflect diet and dietary changes, uh, with particular emphasis with the carbohydrate fermentability, rumen unsaturated fatty acid load, and the forage digestibility or composition. And it know that the management environment can have a tremendous impact on milk composition. In particular, we're going to focus on behavior and rumen function and, and really how that's in, being influenced by this environment. And the probe is going to give us an indication of the physiological state of the cow. And this is going to become more important as we focus on models uh, where we can apply this real time to each cow at each time of milking. But in general, we can think about it as a way to assess the risk of milk fat depression, the energy balance of the cow, as well as the stage of lactation. We did research in 2014 and 2015 on farms from the St. Albans Cooperative with the goal to better understand management and nutritional differences between herds with high and low de novo fatty acids. And you can see we grouped across the two years uh, uh, the descriptive statistics for some of the high and low farms. The first attention to is the de novo fatty acids, where it was definitely higher than the low, 1.13 versus 0.9. And related to that, if we look at the fat for the 2014 year, that followed in line as we expected with a positive relationship, with the higher de novo herds having higher fat whereas the lower de novo herds had lower milk fat. True pro followed along as well. We also saw in the mixed fatty acids between those groupings. Uh, higher, um, there's less of a difference between preformed, especially when we looked at the 2015 uh, survey. The between the two years 
is that the 2014 included Jersey or crossbred herds, and the 2015 year we chose to focus primarily on Holstein herds. And why we're focusing on de novo fatty acids is you're positively related to milk fat and protein uh, content. But in addition, they function, especially fiber fermentation. And because acetate and butyrate, which are the end products of fiber fermentation, are the building blocks for milk fat. Rumen conditions that enhance microbial fermentation stimulate microbial protein production and increase milk The proportion of de novo fatty acids in milk fat really tells us how well the cow is being fed and managed for optimal ruminal fermentation. St. Albans Co-op herds to know what factors were most related to de novo fatty acid content. And what we herds more physically effective fiber, 21%. That's kind of the bookmark. And as they were feeding diets that had less ether extract, less than 3.5%. Now, these findings fit with controlled research that's been done, really focusing on what dietary factors affect milk fat. found that high herds tended to be five times more likely to deliver feed at least twice a day in free stalls. And when we looked at tie stall farms, we found that they were 11 times more likely to deliver feed at five times per day. Now, this emphasizes the importance of feed availability for our cows. In a lot of lines, we found that high novo herds tended to be 10 times more likely to provide at least 18 inches of bunk space per cow, and at least five times more likely to stock stalls at 110%. What we clear from this field work is that in order to achieve or improve yields of fat and protein, we really must focus on diet formulation and then the management environment. The metrics give us another tool to assess how well we are doing in these areas. Tools available. The real question is how can we use them or how should we be using them? And the first approach is in a herd snapshot situation or bullshooting. In a snapshot, a nutritionist may want or a farm may just want to know what does their farm look like and they collect bulk tank samples for one to two days. In some situations, especially when we're trying to troubleshoot maybe a milk fat depression issue, milk may be sampled over five or seven days. Change may be made uh, for management or diet, and then those farms may come back and resample at that time period. Other approaches include uh, evaluating changes over time, and this is really for the farms that uh, are continuously getting results uh, that are part of those co-ops that I mentioned earlier. When we're looking at it over time, one of the things that we really need to emphasize or take note is uh, the natural variation that, that occurs in the farm if there's an opportunity uh, to minimize or uh, take advantage of that variation that is occurring. And then approaches the snapshot and troubleshooting along with evaluating changes over time. It's important to place the values that are received in the context of the season and the stage of lactation. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. year or two, uh, Cornell has analyzed many outside samples as well as the lab here at Minor. And these samples, uh, we've done uh, approximately 170 Holstein herds along with some jerseys. So I just chose to focus on the Holstein data set. And these herds sent samples, uh, they're self-selected, so they uh, we just see maybe a little low fat farms that were trying to solve a milk fat depression. But what is quite noticeable, at least or remarkable for me in the data set, is that there's tremendous variation in Holstein herds. As we have a minimum of a Holstein herd of 3.0 with a max 
4.3%. There's tremendous opportunity within our dairy cows to improve probably fat and protein production as well. What, what we did with this data set was when we were working with the St. Albans data, we established regression equations or relationships between the acid metrics and fat and protein. And these outside samples from across the U.S. and parts of Canada confirm to us that the relationships are consistent, whether we're here in the Northeast or we're uh, collecting milk across the country. I have interest in looking at those regressions or equations. I would encourage you to take a look at uh, Dano's Cornell Nutrition Conference proceedings from 2016 and 2017. Regression equations on the St. Albans data set as well as the 170 U.S. Canadian um, set. We have some bulk tank uh, alarms for Holstein herds. And not alarms, but really these are going to be set based on the goals of the farm. I think many Holstein herds across the U.S. would be want to make sure they had at least 3.8 percent. And so that's what I'm going to use as the basis for the discussion. But really these values come about as a result of evaluating the regression lines. In general, with our goal of 3.8% fat, we would be expecting to see uh, greater than 0.8 de no fatty acids, uh, somewhere around 3 or maybe greater uh, mixed fatty acids, as well as uh, preformed is going to be 1.3 to 1.45 uh, grams per 100 grams of milk. Now, if we want to achieve this higher level of milk fat, we want to keep the fat on saturation as low as possible. And so we get concerned when we see that values start to go above 0.31. can use this information uh, to make some decisions. And here what I've done is looked at the relationship between de novo fatty acids versus the concentration uh, versus the fat content. What you can do is apply a grid structure based on the alarms that I just mentioned, so at 0.8 for de novo fatty acids as well as 3.8% fat, and start to understand how we might think about making decisions based in the context in which quadrant farms. So a farm that's in the upper right-hand quadrant, then things are going fairly well. The rumen is working well based on a high level of de novo fatty acid, as well as the fat content is probably achieving the goals. Fortunately, now in that quadrant, and if we look at the upper left-hand quadrant, we can see that in this particular case, there's less de novo fatty acids relative to the total amount of fat. And so this starts to focus us in on looking at issues with rumen function and potentially the amount of fat that is being fed or even things such as stocking density and the management environment that these animals are housed in and if that's having an impact on feeding behavior, for example. The third question to look at is uh, on the bottom right hand. And, and this is a situation where de novo is high relative to the total amount of fat that we would expect. And in this case, maybe issues occurring or feeding strategies that are shifting how energy is being partitioned between milk fat as well as, or milk production as well as body condition of the cows. There may be opportunities for herds falling in this area to look at their uh, fat supplementation strategies. The fourth we can focus on is the one that's probably uh, the one that gets most attention is this bottom left hand where we have low fat along with low de novo fatty acids and this is our kind of our typical milk fat depression quadrant and we focus on things such as how much fat or rumen unsaturated fatty acid load is being provided in the diets what is the fermentability of the the carbohydrates in particular starch is there enough physical effective fiber to stimulate rumination and uh, proper rumen function. And in addition to dietary factors, we're going to focus on management factors that affect the feeding behavior of the animals or the time budgets of the animals. 
A simple example that uh, shared with me was looking at how milk fatty acids were used to motivate a producer to make a change. The nutritionist had an idea what would be the issue, but uh, these fatty acid metrics helped uh, implement a change. So during the snapshot, the farm had a fat content of 3.4 to 3.5 percent fat, much lower than the farm's goal. You can see the different fatty acid metrics. In general, the de novo fatty acid was lower than we would it want or expect, uh, as well as the mixed fatty acids. And the double bonds per fatty acids on saturation index was much higher uh, than our alarm level. What was identified as the problem was that the diet was too high in rufal. And this is really driven by the use of some homegrown roasted soybeans that were ground extremely fine with a hammer mill. The solution was grind size. The farmer needed to purchase a sieve. And as he started to do that, increase the size almost immediately they started to see an improvement in milk fat and after a few different uh, increases uh, with sieve size, they were able to improve their fat content about uh, three tenths. Along with that, there was an improvement in the de novo fatty acids indicating that uh, there was a change in the rumen uh, fermentation and, and probably the inhibition or some of the biogenation intermediates that were flowing out from that, that rumen. Uh, the still has some opportunity based on where their fat and some of their fatty acid metrics are, but uh, here's just a very simple example of how we can relate some of this information to uh, farm changes. Now, unfortunately, all milk fat depression uh, situations on farms or even low milk fat um, can solve that simply, and so we have to keep in mind that uh, there's several factors that are associated with risk of milk fat depression. We can focus on dietary factors, fermentable, carbohydrates, starch, forage fiber, physically effective fiber, uh, rufal. We keep learning more and more in this area with a real emphasis on the C18-2 being a primary fatty acid responsible or at least related to milk fat depression. There are certain additives that can either increase or uh, help mitigate our risk of milk fat depression in yeast and molds. Um, images or fermented feeds can, can be a concern and actually exacerbate milk fat depression. Along with many dietary factors, we have several uh, how or environmental or management factors that can play a role. And as we cite in our St. Albans crop data, really t things that affect the time budget or feeding behavior of the animal can have a, a tremendous impact on milk fat de depression. As well as, as we see more and more farms implementing robots for milking, I think we need to go back and revisit some of our feeding strategies and think about uh, the use of PR and component feeding and how we're going to uh, be able to increase or promote root function that's going to help us maximize milk, pro milk fat synthesis. They're at risk or starting to track their uh, milk samples of time. When they're starting to heading into a milk fat depression scenario, it's going to usually a, be a gradual change in fat, and sometimes you don't even notice it until you say, wow, we're already here. As we're tracking through the milk acid metrics, what we see is an increase in the saturation index, and that oftentimes is going to be uh, occurring when it's greater than 0.31 double bonds per fatty acid. At the same time, uh, we'll start to see a decrease in the amount of mixed fatty acids that are present in the milk. And as this scenario continues, then we'll continue to see a decrease in mixed fatty acid and uh, de novo fatty acid concentration in the milk. If it goes on long enough, then it may have some negative impacts on true protein as well. Now, depression, when it occurs and we see these changes occurring, one of the things we want to do is start to ask, when did the problem start? And it doesn't usually start one day and mm -hmm. then we see the response uh, immediately. There's a bit of a lag, especially when it's diet-induced. And this can be up to seven to ten days based on some of the work that's um, coming out of Penn State as well as uh, other locations. When this is happening, we really want to focus in on some of those risk factors I already identified really to milk fat depression, but considering the diet, polyunsaturated fat acids, carbohydrate fermentability, 
room modifiers, and, and feeding management. Now, once dietary management changes are put into place, it's going to take some time to be able to recover milk fat. Uh, we start to see some changes in the profiles of the fatty acid metrics. Oftentimes, maybe sooner before we see total fat, but it's going to take maybe 10 to 14 days in some uh, dietary situations to be able to see uh, a re response changes. I talked about some of the snapshot and troubleshooting um, ways that we can use these milk fatty acids. I want to uh, a couple minutes talking about how we can evaluate ch changes over time. In this case, our goal is to be able to have increased de novo fatty acid and mixed fatty acids in ways that are going to support a higher level of milk fat and protein. And we do see increases in de novo and mix. It's usually in response to positive change that's been made um, on function or feed quality. Uh, and so when we're using some of the supplemental fatty acid products, we'll see an increase in the mixed fatty acid uh, group. And in cases we do see an increase in preformed fatty acid, this may result in some changes in the dietary formulation related to fat supplementation, or it could be a change in forage quality or something that has caused a change in how the cow is mobilizing body condition and that contribution to total milk fat. The usual concern is when I'm seeing decreases in de novo mixed or uh, preformed that's going to suggest that something has changed and that requires further evaluation. And an increase in the unsaturation index, that increases the risk for milk fat depression. So now we're tracking milk fatty acid metrics over time, the herd's typical variation. And see here, I've just selected a herd that was tracked for a 13-month period of time. Their fat was 3.8%. And you can see the means for the fatty acid metrics and calculate a standard deviation. Now, if you start to use this approach and do it across herds, the standard deviation as an indication of variation may be useful within herd, but it's not as easy to compare across herds. That's where I like to express this information on a coefficient of variation. Um, that's calculated as the standard deviation divided by the mean times of 100. We're still trying to learn what is normal variation across the herds that we're tracking, and within that, trying to identify where there's opportunities. And what was interesting to note is some of our herds with the highest level of variation across the year were the herds that actually um, milk fat uh, during summer months. And so I think there's some opportunities to use this variation to assess how we're doing some management practices, such as heat abatement, for example. This is your example of a, a farm where we, we tracked milk fat across time. And you can see that there's some variation, but if you draw a trend line, you really, really can't see uh, that there was much of a, a change in one direction or the other. And so it was kind of limited in telling us what was happening. Use this control process chart approach to look at, okay, what is the mean and a plus or minus the standard deviation uh, for that time period. And then minus the standard deviation is really going to be contingent on what is meaningful for the farm that you're working at and what level of control variation do they want to react to or account for. And here's an example where um, in a real farm situation, we looked at the fat. We didn't see much of a change that I just showed you. But in that case, we look at beds um, occurring across time. Uh, you can see that in this November 25th time frame that something happened. All of a sudden, the preformed fatty acid profile or decreased and the mixed fatty acids increased. In this case, That means you can see that there's a deviation. If we just focus on the preformed, we can see applying the, the control process chart 
that there were several days where the preform fell below the lower expected range. And when this was investigated, there was a planned change that was made with the BMR corn silage, increasing its inclusion rate in the diet. As there was a, a different feeder. And so this confirmed some plan changes that the farm had, had made. Now in some sessions, this these metrics over time can be used to help identify an unplanned change. And this is the situation here with forage quality. You can see in the June month that all of a sudden the form fatty acids that had had been lower typically than the mixed fatty acids now are higher on a concentration basis. What's interesting to note is if you look at the purple line, that there really is uh, much of a change in the fat during that time period. But what was remarkable is this change. And what it suggested is, is that forage had changed. The cows were probably not getting as much energy from that forage. As, as the, and so they started mobilizing a bit more condition. Or but that ended up going into milk uh, with a change in overall milk fat. Now, if this continued on for a period of time in this situation, the farm identified this, tested some pores, and realized the corn silage had decreased in digestibility and fiber digestibility and starch content, and they made a dietary change. But if this had continued, this is the situation, I think, when you walk herds and all of a sudden you realize cows have gotten thin, this is it. Maybe you can pick up that type of change sooner than waiting till the cows are thin. Now, that are going to affect the variation that we see day to day or across the year within a herd and also between herds. And we mentioned a couple, I shared you a couple of examples already related to diet changes and feed quality. But we can't forget to think about the consistency to day to day can be affected by. Uh, management practices that disturb or disrupt the time budget of the cow. Uh, we oftentimes can see changes or in protocol compliance uh, when there's days off or vacations or release milk feeders are put in place. Seasonally, we'll see weather changes or even um, this fall as we've had uh, some warm weather and then some cold weather, we'll see some larger uh, changes in the, the composition of the milk components. And then one that you can't forget about, especially as you you're that and trying to interpret bulk tank results is that the sequence of or if different milking shifts go into different tanks, that can have an impact um, on the milk composition. So the milk composition of fat and protein and the associated fatty acids are not consistent necessarily uh, from milking to milking uh, within a 24-hour period, um, in part due to some circadian rhythms. So it suggests that maybe there's some opportunity if you have a farm that has large differences between milking shifts, uh, there's some opportunity to look at feed availability and time budgets or potentially unique feeding strategies that help support some of the circadian rhythms um, and Penn State is doing some work related to that. Now we started with the uh, goal of to increase milk fat and protein content and yield. But in the field, as we've been talking with nutritionists and uh, their concern is, are we going to lose milk as we start to try to change formulation or management strategies to increase, for example, de novo fatty acids? And over the next slides, I'm going to show you some data from our 170 cow um, or 70 herd data set um, related to things. Uh, two graphs, and on the x-axis it's showing milk yield uh, in pounds per day. And so you can see the 170 herds that we received samples from, there was quite a range in performance level of these herds. And if we look at the amount of fat and protein that is produced per day, the grams increase as the cows increase more milk. And this is definitely what we would expect. Interesting to look at is if we use those same herds and we look at milk again on the axis, and now on the axis we have the three fatty acid groupings, the de novo mixed and preformed, expressed as a concentration of grams per hundred grams of milk, and we can see very clearly that it's like a shotgun effect. There's very little relationship. The R squared values are very low, 
and so there is no relationship. So the cows that produce more milk don't necessarily uh, have a higher concentration of de novo fatty acids in them or not. But what's important to take note of is that cows that produce more milk, and now we look at instead of the fatty acid groupings on a concentration basis, we look on a yield basis. We can see in milk yield increases, we see an increase in de novo mixed preformed uh, yields as well. Suggesting that if we are focusing on trying to improve de novo fatty acid yield or total fat yield, we don't necessarily expect to see a drop in milk production. It was looked at the concentration of the de novo fatty acids on the x-axis relative to the grams of fat produced per day on the y-axis. In this case, we wanted to see if the relationship changed when we looked at different production levels of the herds. And in this case, we just evenly distributed the, the herds that were part of the data set into five group, groupings. And then you can see here that all of those groupings have very similar type of relationship, a positive relationship between de novo fatty acids and a concentration basis and total fat. To me, confirming that on farm, one of our goals as we're tracking these metrics, it should be that we want to continue to try to improve de novo fatty acids um, whenever we can if our goal is to increase milk fat and protein on our farm. To consider when we're trying to interpret milk fatty acid metrics, and this is regardless of whether it's a snapshot or we're monitoring changes over time, well, things that we definitely need to make sure we understand is that there's seasonal and stage of lactation effects, as well as herd distribution of, of this as well. So we're with looking at some seasonal changes in milk composition. I'm sure most people are very familiar with the seasonal effects that we see for shown here in the blue line and, and protein red line across two and a half years. With the sun, at least here in the northern hemisphere, being uh, in milk fat. Protein would follow a similar pattern. Take it one step further and we look at, again, fat change over the same time period. But add to that, looking at the de novo fatty acid concentration, what we can see is that probably a large percentage of, of the variation that we see in milk fat percentage can be explained by the de novo fatty acid composition of that milk. If we do the same exercise for fat shown in the light blue and look at the relationship with mixed fat acids shown in the dark blue or black line uh, along with preform shown in the purple line, what we can see is that mix tends to follow the fat level, and that makes sense, uh, similar to de novo. Uh, we don't see as much of a relationship when we focus on the preformed fatty acids. And what this tells me is there's opportunity that in the summer months, if we can do something that is going to improve de novo, then we can probably do some things to uh, improve the fat, and that may be where our focus area is is going to be, so on de novo and mixed fatty acid group. Now, is uh, herd distribution for uh, cows that were sampled individually, their samples analyzed, and then looked uh, just to see where it fell on the spectrum for fat and the fatty acid groupings. And what you can see, there's a, a wide range in values across uh, these cows. And so variation is influenced by several different factors, um, but include parity and days in milk. So this is something you need to keep in mind as we start to interpret some bulk tank uh, values is, you know, what does the herd look like? And if all of a sudden we have a lot of early lactation cows, then the distribution of these are going to shift uh, in a particular direction, and that's going to ultimately influence the bulk tank uh, values. So a better idea of that, I just wanted to share with you some graphs looking at stage of lactation effects on milk components. And as many of you are probably aware, we can see um, time effects for fat, protein, and lactose, with fat being highest early in lactation and decreasing as the cow comes 
comes back into positive energy balance, and then as she goes through later lactation, um, that increases uh, protein following a similar type of pattern. Now, if we look on a pounds basis, uh, the yield is going to peak in early to, to mid lactation and then gradually decrease following the curve of milk yield. Look at how these curves change with the milk fed. In the panel, we have the three fatty acids the groupings expressed as grams per 100 grams of milk. And if we farm first, as we would expect with a cow that's in negative energy balance, she's going to be mobilizing fat, and that fat NIFA is going to be incorporated into milk fat, and uh, there's going to be a high level. And then as she approaches positive energy balance, that's going to decrease. De novo fat tend to be uh, lower in the early part of lactation and then, then uh, increase as lactation uh, progresses and mix follows a similar pattern. Now I think it's more interesting to look at the yield that's shown on the right hand graph and what we see is the contribution of preform to the total uh, fat uh, decreases over lactation with the novo fatty acids uh, increasing and the mix increasing lactation, plateauing, and then uh, eventually decreasing later in lactation. Now why this becomes important is if, if you start to look at bulk tank values and you heard that calves ate seasonally, uh, it's really going to shift uh, some of these values. So a herd that has a very early uh, days in milk, maybe closer to 120 days, is going to be very different in this profile than potentially a herd that is 150 or 170 days in milk. Your index changes similar to uh, preformed fatty acid concentration. So I'm showing the double bonds across the lactation uh, in the and then in the red line uh, you can see the preformed fatty acids and they as we adjust the scales they follow a very similar pattern. Where this becomes important is that if you're using the unsaturation index to look at the risk that a herd has for milk fat depression, that if all of a sudden because of some changes in calving schedule, the unsaturation index increases because you have cow more cows in negative energy balance that increase in preformed fatty acids, the increase in the unsaturation index doesn't necessarily increase suggesting that you have an increased risk of milk fat depression. It's just reflecting the type of fatty acid profile within the milk. Today we focused on the bulk tank and how we're sampling that and using the milk fatty acid metrics. For me, I wait until we have a milk testing system that we can apply on farm and be able to analyze now, every day at every milking and be able to use these milk fatty acid metrics along with other unique management tools. This is an area that uh, as corn and miner is actively working on, trying to develop individual cow models uh, related to sickness detection, inflammation, rumen pH, and other measures that we think will be related to improving uh, on farm management. But in the meantime, I think there's um, you know, easy opportunity to improve beyond just the bulk tank uh, measurements, and this is through the use of group or pen or string sampling. And you can install an inline sampler. Some farms use this already for direct load uh, type situations. It just results in a need to change out the collection container more frequently to be able to look at this. And one of the reasons I'm encouraging folks to start doing this when they're troubleshooting herds is that if you make a particular dietary change and let's say you're focused on the high group, they make a change there but you don't do anything else for the remainder of the herd, that all that milk is pooled together and that high group milk essentially is diluted with the rest of the herd. It's harder to sometimes detect uh, subtle changes uh, in milk composition in that way. But when you have the ability to start looking at groups, sampling, then it uh, provides a little more insight. And I just want to share with you an example of that. Showing in the turquoise blue color tank two, this is a bulk tank sample. And you can see across three days, it's very consistent, just a little below 4% fat. 
The others represent PIN numbers. And if you look at the blue line across time, you can see that fat is increasing in that herd, but that wasn't reflected uh, within the tank sample. Uh, you can see there's a bit of a decline, especially on the third day for the PEN2. Uh, the PEN3, it goes up and it comes back down. And so really fat on a bulk tank basis is not responsive or indicating that there were some changes occurring within these groups. And these groups were different diets. Now what's interesting is if you do that same exercise, looking now instead of fat, you look at de novo fatty acid concentration. In this case, same time point, the turquoise tank two color, you can see that actually in the third sampling it does drop and suggests that all right, you know overall fat hasn't changed yet as we saw on the previous graph, that there is something changing, the composition of the fat is changing and whether that's planned or if that's unexpected, that gives an opportunity to maybe react to a situation sooner than you might otherwise do. Taking a step further, if we look at now again the de novo fatty acids, you can die there's some movement across the days in the particular groups and the contribution or the amount of fat that's being uh, generated uh, in those milk samples. And so this in particular would be a big opportunity for PEN3 to identify what has happened in that third sampling time point. Spent the last 50 minutes or so talking about milk fatty acid metrics and their use for making herd management decisions. I view them as just another tool in the toolbox. It will be helpful in some situations, but not necessarily in all situations. They're going to be best used in conjunction with diet information, the management, inf management information, or other data capture system, systems that may be on farm. It's an assessment that the producer and the nutritionist can do because they know the herd best that's going to be able to implement and utilize this information. And I guess I just want to make sure that we're not using this fatty acid metrics information in a vacuum because we do, that could lead to a wrong decision and potential actions on the farm. So I think that these milk fatty acid metrics have is that they can give you clues as to what's happening on farm. They can be more specific in milk fat or milk protein alone. Low milk fat caused by different factors and the infrared technology in these milk fatty acid metrics provide information that may allow us to identify what's wrong um, in a way we haven't been able to do before. In addition, there may be situations where it allows us to make more rapid decision making or at least identify a problem earlier than what we might have otherwise done. Join the webinar today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, how much? Um, can you hear me okay? All right, because um, we've had a little bit of um, like weird things going on with muting my mic and unmuting my mic. Um, before we take questions and answer, or before we take questions and you provide answers, and I'll tell my people to put it in the chat window or the question and answer if you have some questions. Um, I'm going to go through uh, some discussion of what we're doing next. So let me take back the presentation. And let's move through. All right. Um, as you may know, if you're a frequent attendee to our webinars, we take a break through the month of December and January to get through the holidays. Um, our first presentation for the 2018 the Nutritionist Series will be from Dr. Chris Chase, a professor at the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences at South Dakota State University. A South Dakota native, Dr. Chase's research focuses on viral infections and methods of preventing virus infections in animals. His talk will be Nutrition Immunology, Understanding How to Maximize the Good and Minimize the Bad. This is on February 14th, so this is a great way to spend a romantic evening on Valentine's Day. And it, again, it will be at 5 p.m. <clears throat> Dr. Chase's presentation is actually a continuation of the mini unit that we ha featured this past year in 2017 on nutrition 
and immunology. And this was thanks to a suggestion by um, one of our sponsors. So that, that really helped us a great deal on, on knowing what people they're interested in. We're excited for next year to bring another great group of speakers for the 2018 Nutritionists. We have a full roster, and it looks like this. We're going to have Chris Chase in February, Laura Hernandez at the University of Wisconsin in March, Tom Overton from Cornell University in April, Phil Coso, University of Illinois in May, Corey Jones from the Central Sandsbury in June, Marcia Endress, University of Minnesota in July, Heidi Rossau, University of California, Davis in August, Trevor DeVries, University of Guelph in September, Adam Locke, Michigan State in October, and Bill Weiss from The Ohio State in November. And we'll get a full roster up with what they'll be speaking on. Our focus next year is going to be a mini-series on cow comfort and behavior, which comes back around to some of the things Heather talked about tonight in animal behavior and how you're feeding, not just what you're feeding. Um, Paula and I are going to also embark on trying to do a, a, a nutrient series very similar to this for beef cattle nutrition. So stay tuned for more information on that. As always, we want to thank our generous sponsors and they help help provide the the work behind the speakers that we are able to get and all the work that goes into these webinars. Um, Tom Tuluki and AMTS for supporting this, and they go USA and Global. Marcos Neves Piera from the University of Lavras, who helped um, Marcelo Hens Ramos Shear from Three Lab, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and we have translators in each of those locations. Generous sponsors that make it possible to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ejinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids. Silver sponsors, are Hammer Animal Nutrition, R&D Life Sciences, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Jerry One Forge Laboratory, and Lynn Laboratories. Our bronze sponsors are Joe, Life Made Easier, AO, Amino Max, and Quality Liquid Feeds. I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Um, people have started typing them into the chat, which is fantastic. And I do want to say, we really have spanned the globe this year. I'm pretty sure I have a, a person joining us from England tonight, which means it's quite late. And um, I received notice from one of our distributors in China telling us that um, they're broadcasting live in China. So we have no idea how many people are actually listening. Um, I'm going to open up the mic and see if Paula has any questions uh, or Mar Marcelo. I'm not sure if Marcelo is doing all the translating and whether he'll be able to ask questions or not. Um, I do have some questions from Marcos because he couldn't join us today. So I'll start with Marcelo. Are you? Heather? Yes. Okay. Do you have questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, we have two questions by now. Okay, you go first, and I'll check with Marcelo and see okay. if you have questions. Okay. Um, uh, Heather, where you showed um, you grind the soybean too fine and grind it. Uh, um, how any variation in milk yield and protein content? Great question. So the um, protein content is similar in that farm. I don't recall the exact numbers for milk yield, but I don't, I don't uh, believe a decrease in yield or a change, but there was definitely an improvement in fat. And it really related to probably the the release. So once we focus rufal, rumen saturated fatty acid load, and the grams is important, but it's probably more important that we start to focus on particular fatty acids within that or the release rate, the, the lipolysis rate that's occurring. And by grinding that soybean smaller, it likely made that fat more accessible and had a negative effect on rumen function, the microbes that were in the rumen. In the, the size of that, we're able to um, decrease probably 
functionally the amount of fatty acids that those microbes were experiencing or having to biohydrogenate. Paula, oh, okay, she needs more time. Um, I have a question from Aiden Kushner. Um, he asks, can milk fatty acids be used to assess the risk of acidosis or, um, I'm sorry, ketosis, sorry, I read that wrong, or other transition cow disorders? Yeah, now, uh, bulk tank-wise, um, that's limited, but one of the projects that we have going on here at the Institute is using uh, milk fatty acids, sorry, milk samples from fresh cows to identify health issues. And so, um, DHI programs, for example, people have looked at the protein ratios. Uh, we now have BHBA levels in some labs. So those are related to health. We're going a step beyond that. We can look at the ratios of, for example, preformed fatty acids to de novo fatty acids. And we're finding that that's related to the risk factor for cows experiencing ketosis and displaced abomasums. And displaced abomasums a few days before cows will show clinical signs. So we're trying to understand how we can take advantage of that type of information. We're also using the milk specter or milk composition to identify cows that are, have high levels or low levels of inflammation. And so that may give us an opportunity as we learn more from folks like Barry Bradford at Kansas State and the negative impacts of chronic inflammation, systemic inflammation in transition cows that now maybe we'll have a um, tool that we can use to assess, okay, are these cows experiencing? So, so I see tremendous opportunity uh, for their first cows and how we can use milk information to make better management decisions or identify at risk animals. Animals. A model where we can look at milk and tell you what the cow's blood NEFA is. So that gives us a risk or an indication of body fat mobilization. And normally we would look at BHBA in the fresh cow, but for me in some situations, I think knowing the fat load that that cow is experiencing may be just as important as to knowing when the cow gets to the point that she's having some subclinical ketosis. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to share and bring to the industry some other models that will be useful. I was going to ask the next question. Yes. Yeah. Based on the, um, on the analysis of groups of fatty acids, uh, do you, do you, can you give us an idea of the effect of changing some ingredients as uh, DGF or cotton seed uh, in in those values? Yeah, I think it depends um, when you're changing. Definitely feedstuffs is going to impact the milk composition. And on a bulk tank basis, if large enough changes are made with certain dietary ingredients, you will, will see that. Uh, the so when we change, for example, use of cotton seed or distillers, um, really looking at uh, the amount of fat in the diet or more particular fatty acids, the ruminant saturated fatty acid load or the C182 uh, in particular, and try and estimate. I think the specific numbers, I think we can model that through, through the different platforms that we're using or through CNCPS or AMTS. Um, but things we have to keep in mind is that sometimes um, there are ways that uh, those feeds to the animal can exacerbate the, the issue. For example, in the soybean example I shared, um, I think one of the things that we haven't done on farm well is, especially for farms that feed a lot of corn silage or feedstuffs that potentially could have a large range in fatty acids that we've just used dictionary or book values for those and that we need to start paying attention probably to analyzing uh, more feedstuffs uh, for a particular fatty acid profile so that we can do a better job of characterizing that diet that's being fed to the cows. But in some situations, the milk is going to show us that probably where, let's say, our characterization isn't matching what the cow is seeing and experiencing, then the milk helps fills in that gap a little bit. That you say that I remember 
for um, the talk that Sam Fezenden gave earlier this summer, and he was talking about um, how important it is to have good analysis in those models. They really help dial into what the cows are showing is happening with them. So that's just another point for doing more feed analysis, I guess. Um, I'm going to ask a question that was sent to me by Mark in Brazil. He has a couple for me, so he asked really good questions. You probably remember that from last year. Um, so the first one is, could you comment on the use of this index, de novo to fat, concentration to concentration, or yield to yield? I assume the high positive correlation between de novo in grams per day and fat in grams per day and de novo in grams per 100 grams and fat percent is expected. Thrills should not be of this de novo to fat. Um, should um, would the thresholds be? I'm trying to interpret this last sentence. I'm sorry. <coughs> should the of de novo to fat as a, be a sign of ruminal acidosis? I'm trying to make sure I understand all the points. So I think we definitely have more to learn as we're mining through this data, and we see more and more um, herds from different parts of the country or um, with, with different strategies. Uh, just back up, and I didn't show the data today, but the relationship between concentration of de novo and grams of de novo in milk is highly correlated, as well as uh, grams of de novo or the concentration and fat. And so those are very strong relationships. Uh, looked at, um, I guess, the approach that he's thinking of for threshold for de novo to, to fat in the situation. And when we first started doing some of this work, we were looking at the relative percent. So and I guess in that case, um, the, the fatty acids in, let's say, the fat that's coming from de novo mixed and, and preformed. In the case, we were seeing de novo concentrations, a relative percent of when we greater than 24 we thought things were okay, and when we got less than 24, um, that maybe there was some concern. And so as we collected more information, we moved away from expressing the data on a relative percent, realizing that when we look at grams per 100 grams of milk, um, I think, one, it's more intuitive to understand, and two, it was more highly related to the yield of fat and protein, and so that's the direction we've gone. One of the projects that we have right now is, is uh, trying to see if we can use the milk uh, composition or spectral features to be able to uh, develop a rumen pH model or look at some relationships with uh, subacute ruminal acidosis or hours below 5.8 uh, pH, for example. And so hopefully uh, um, over the next uh, several months uh, we'll have something to share there. Uh, Paula has just let me know that they're going to have to leave because they're having trouble with um, transitions. They're apparently ha having some trouble down there. So if you see her, see her leaving, leaving the room, Heather, it's nothing to do with you. It's all <laughs> to do with the platform. Dinner um, time, right? It's dinner time, yeah. My <laughs> uh, next question is also from Marcos, and um, he asked, it's very interesting that the use of the saturation index as a diagnose for excessive rufal. This number, could it also be used to troubleshoot fat to protein inversions? How do you deal with the protein content in this equation? Um, do you deal with the protein content? I assume acidosis would reduce both protein and fat, but excess rufal um, not at a level capable of reducing ruminal microbial yield would reduce fat without reducing protein. Could you develop a little more on how it would be used to separate acidosis from accessorated, excessive fat acids to the cause of low milk fat? Did you copy it into the chat window? Uh, if you want to, I think, uh, uh, so the nutrition index of all the 
uh, fatty acid metrics. Those are pr that's the one that, um, if I recall properly, is has the lowest correlation coefficient to fat and protein. Although directionally we see some changes. So I think in situations where uh, we're seeing some is in de novo and mixed. Uh, along with a change in unsaturation index, and we're kind of in the mid uh, date in milk for a herd profile, for example, that then we're going to um, be able to know uh, with some of the 170 herd data set that some of those samples that came in, especially if they were outlier unusual samples, um, uh, on the spectrum or distribution of de novo, mixed, or preformed, we took those samples and they went through gas chromatography, the gold standard for fatty acids, so we could confirm that our model was working well. And doing that, uh, we can look at some of the other uh, fatty acid components that aren't characterized directly with these metrics. And so we do see situations where where the increase in unsaturation index is related to the biohydrogenation mediate, intermediates that we know are uh, related to milk fat depression. So we'll see changes in 18.1, um, trans 10, for example, or uh, the other uh, trans 10 cis 12 CLA that's going to um, relate to milk fat depression. A question from. Um um, Sador or does how does forage forages how how influencing those de novo fatty acids? He's guessing that the seasonality changes could also attri be attribute, attributing to changes in forage quality over the year. Do you think you can? And he says it's great to talk. <laughs> Hi, Salvador. Thanks. The uh, so we can see some forage changes, whether those changes are related to seasonal effects. Uh, usually we're making some dietary adjustments to account for some of the seasonal changes, for example, in starch digestibility that c occurs with corn silage. But with the example that I showed earlier where within a, a bonk we are routinely testing, we saw the milk fatty acids picked up a change in that forage quality, a, a decrease in fiber digestibility and starch content. Uh, during the time period. So in that case, I think we can, we haven't looked at any data uh, specifically to track forages, just seasonal changes related to composition, but whether some of that's contributing to seasonal patterns in the milk components that we see. And that's a possibility, but uh, I think most nutritionists, especially with programs like AMTS, are looking at fermentable carbohydrates and trying to adjust for some of that seasonal change in forages. I have a question from Will Seymour, but I'm not, um, I haven't been successful at knowing quite what he's asking. Um, can you see the question and answer? The Q&A. Uh, Make it smaller and it'll be easier for you to see. Oh, here. There. Okay, okay now I'm looking. Uh, I'll read it out loud, and then maybe you'll interpret what the C to C equals C equal means. Uh, he said it's interesting that mobilized body fat is high enough in unsaturated fatty acid to affect milk fat, and he says C equals C. Is this a secondary effect in the mammary gland? And can you elaborate on that? Uh, Heather? Are you there? Let's go big again. All right, so everybody, it sounds like maybe we've lost connection with her. She still looks like she's in the room. Back. You're back. Thank God. <laughs> All right. So I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, uh, we're questioning. I thought I was done. So no. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I have to give that some thought and get back to Okay. It. 
Are you um, give that thought and and shoot me an email about it. What we'll do is we'll send it out to um, we'll see everybody that's listening. And if that sounds okay with you, sure. Right. I have one more question. Unless somebody types something, um, from Mar- Marcos, have you looked at the use of preformed fatty acids? Um, either as, as grams per 100 grams or gram per day or grams per fat as a measure of body fat mobilization postpartum and does it correlate with NEFA, BHA, or fat protein? And I'm, I'll send that off as a chat to you so you can see it. Yeah, so preformed fatty acids, we see relationships when cows are in negative energy balance that preformed level is high, and so um, we've used that um, information that's being generated from the spectra, and part of that's um, probably then the model that we've developed uh, indirectly for uh, blood NEFA that we can estimate, so we will see an increase in preformed uh, value. Uh, and then uh, cows, when you look on an individual herd basis, uh, it directly related the preformed fatty acids to a uh, uh, cow in looking at how much weight she's lost. We've just done it indirectly through blood measurements uh, for BHBA or for NEFA. Um, but that w- that's an interesting point. We, we probably have the data here that we could be able to, to look at that more closely. Okay, unless somebody is quick to type something more in, I think that we are exhausted from questions <laughs> in all ways. <laughs> all right. So I think we'll sign off at this point. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us. Um, if people have to know, have to type it in really quick. Otherwise, we will we'll say thank you for joining us and for everybody listening, join us again next year and don't hesitate to drop us all a note if there's specific topics that you would like to have covered um, because that's how we know who to get for speakers. Um, thank you, us, Heather. Thanks for me. Have a good night. You too. Right. And we'll say goodbye, everybody.